morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, my sincere gratitude for inviting me on behalf of the European Commission uh, to speak to you about this very important topic uh, of pain, but also this gives me an opportunity to put that in the wider context, tell you something about the latest developments in the area of public health that are relevant uh, to chronic pain, uh, and what we as policymakers, as we have just heard, can do and should do to help Europe to face the many new challenges and uh, some old existing ones in our societies. This event brings together you as stakeholders to discuss pain, and um, I applaud this team because it reflects many direct and indirect links to a number of important issues that the European Commission uh, aims to take forward and is taking forward. As you know, the Commission under President Juncker is committed to a new start for Europe on jobs, growth, and competitiveness. And even if we reflect for just a few minutes on this, it's clear that the common denominator here is human capital. We cannot have a successful Europe without uh, taking care of our prime asset, which is the population of Europe. That is what we have. Um, and this is at the heart of our work. Um, of course, health is important, and within that, there are so many important issues. No single issue can be described as unimportant. So we had a very difficult choice ahead of us. Trying to deal with everything means that nothing gets done, unfortunately. So we have been really identifying the areas that, have, that should have the highest priority. And the key factor for that is selecting those areas that have the highest EU added value. Just to give you uh, a few examples that are relevant uh, to chronic pain and, and pain in general, um, we have been working in the area of rare disease policy. Uh, I think this is a good obvious example of where EU added value is easy to identify and where we have a need, in some cases a desperate need, for new innovative solutions. We have heard some examples already this morning of conditions that are not very prevalent, but are there are so many of these conditions that in total many millions of Europeans suffer from rare diseases. Many of these are genetic conditions, not all, uh, but certainly pain is often strongly associated with many of them, if not most of them. Uh, recently, we have uh, started, uh, we have established uh, what we call the European Reference Networks. 24 such networks, almost 1,000 specialized health centers across Europe that will help with the assistance of the Commission uh, to bridge gaps in availability of treatments across the EU. Our intention here is very simple. We want to bring expertise to the patient wherever possible, and wherever that is not possible, facilitate access of patients to diagnosis and treatment, even across borders. So this is a big challenge. But of course, it's not just limited to rare diseases. We, we would like to extend this concept in the coming years to other health areas, uh, particularly for uh, specialized treatments or conditions that require specialized treatments. Another major challenge we are facing is the issue of digitalization. Um, no sector is um, um, exempt from this, and certainly we feel that the health sector in particular maybe is, not, is lagging behind in terms of um, using the full potential of digitalization. This is a major opportunity that we should be embracing and we are working closely on how we can support uh, bringing digital innovation into the health sector. And over the summer, we will have a public consultation uh, on uh, a possible uh, document that we will issue towards the end of this year on how this can be done. Uh, there will be three pillars of this work. First of all, we need to ensure that patients, and all of us indeed, have the right to access our personal health records irrespective of our physical location. Very often this is not possible today. It's scattered all over the place, which can sometimes pose a real risk if we need urgent treatment. It also leads to um, um, a, a difficulty to provide a patient-centered uh, treatment. The second pillar will be to make much better use of the huge mass of data that health systems generate on a daily basis. Only a very small fraction of that is used, for example, for research uh, or for optimizing treatment. It's not simply not available. Uh, and we need to turn health data into a resource. 
Uh, and the third pillar will be to facilitate, to use technology, digital technology, to facilitate the interaction, two-way interaction, I must emphasize, between patient and healthcare provider. Just to give you an example, today it is very difficult to um, ensure uh, remote monitoring of patients outside of hospital settings. Um, how do we manage to get also the feedback from the patients, patient reported experiences and patient reported outcomes, very relevant in the area of pain, because that's the only way you can measure it. There is no pain meter. You cannot measure pain except by listening to what the patient has to say about it. This is very valuable information as well, because if it can happen in real time, if doctors, if um, the, the, the developers of uh, solutions can actually have this information, it will help them optimize and develop treatments, uh, and also being able to address this. So this is another area where I think uh, we can work together very productively. Another area that we need to work on is um, to ensure that we have the solid evidence that we need to back up our decisions and to support policymaking. Policymakers cannot work through guesswork. They have to know the facts before they can act. Uh, Evidence-based policymaking. And this is, I think, one of the areas where the European Union can be most useful. Not just because by acting at union level, we have a critical mass of data that no other region in the world can really match. But because the fact that you have diversity in our health systems and our medical traditions is actually a big strength. You can compare results uh, from different approaches and actually learn from that. But it has to be organized. It will not happen spontaneously. It has to be organized and done in a standardized way. So we are working also on how we can bring evidence. And there are, there's lots of evidence, but a lot of it is not user friendly. It's not designed for policymakers. It's difficult to act upon. Um, and we have put in place from this year what we call the state of health in the EU, which is a cycle where we provide factual information. We are working on this jointly with the OECD and with the WHO Observatory for Health Systems and Policies to make sure that policymakers have all the evidence they need in a format which is appropriate for them. In its first deliverable, the uh, report called Health at a Glance, we last year we issued, um, we highlighted the high economic costs and labor market impacts of chronic diseases and related risk factors. For example, the premature deaths of working age adults led to an annual loss of around 115 billion euros for the EU economy. This is just one example of the facts that somehow escape the attention of policymakers. And there are many, many others. As part of this state of health cycle, this year, on, the, on, the 28th, on November, we will publish profiles, health profiles for all EU member states. And these profiles will not only provide information on the health status, a snapshot, but more importantly, they will underline opportunities for improvement, particularly where we, could, we can use EU-level instruments to help drive that improvement. This process should also be a trigger to show which areas where we need to invest more to improve population health, a kind of screening at population level to identify the main challenges. And this brings me to another issue with high added value. It's not enough to diagnose problems, to screen and identify issues. We also need to identify effective remedies, particularly effective prevention uh, interventions, primary and secondary prevention. It's clear we have a lot of evidence, and we also have a lot of powerful tools at European level, financial tools, policy tools, the convening power of the European Union. But what we do not have enough of is actual implementation of practices which have proven useful. Um, good practice does not travel well in the European Union, unfortunately. Sometimes not even within the same member state. Uh, it remains well hidden at a local or regional level, does not travel beyond that. We need to change that. Um, for many years now, we have had a lot of joint actions and other European projects that have developed recommendations, good practices, guidelines, and other tools. But the utilization of this by member states is still far from optimal. And this is why a mechanism to help deciding the best available tools to be implemented in the member states would add value in the EU. Uh, in close collaboration with the member states, we have launched in DG Health a new steering group on promotion and prevention, which brings together senior officials, policymakers from the EU member states and the EEA countries 
and they have agreed to focus on three objectives for their work. First objective is to establish clear political priorities for deciding which best practices need to be implemented nationally and regionally. What do um, decision makers need most? They have to tell us this. We cannot guess this for them, but we are ready to support them once they identify. And the steering group has already had a first round of possible best practices targeted for implementation. And the Commission and the Member States are now looking at the best ways to promote their practical implementation at national, regional, or European level as appropriate. And of course, we will support this financially through the health program, but also through other financial mechanisms of the EU such as, for example, the Structural Reform Support System, the SRSS, which is a new system put in place by the European Commission to support reform in the member states. And already this year, we plan to include a number of pilots in the annual work plan for the 2018 health program. The Commission realizes that decision makers need to have facts that are readily available. And, and in, with this in mind, we are creating also what we call a new resource center which will be a one-stop shop on such best practices to support evidence-based policy making, particularly on prevention and management of non-communicable diseases. Furthermore, as we have just heard, the new joint action on chronic diseases in 2017 uh, onwards will also provide support for the member states in the implementation of national non-communicable disease plans. We have a good experience of just how important these national plans can be in the area of cancer and in the area of rare diseases. We need to extend this concept also to chronic conditions, particularly the prevalent uh, chronic conditions. The second objective of the steering group will be to create an effective information exchange with the sectorial expert groups on public health. Um, we host in the European Commission a range of expert groups where member states are represented. But very often, these groups work in silos. They work in isolation. We believe the time has come to ensure more cross-fertilization and exchange, particularly for topics such as pain, which are horizontal by nature, by definition. Um, we also need to be much better informed about how the outputs of these expert groups are used and implemented in the member states. There is simply too sharp a divide between what happens at the European level and what happens at the national level. This is not the best way to tackle things. Europe and the national level should work together. This is not a competition, this is a collaboration. And therefore, this under the steering group will ensure a more dynamic information exchange. That the groups will produce outputs that are needed from the general policy perspective. So it, this should be a, a demand and supply arrangement. And the third focus of the steering group will be to look at ways to foster multi-sectorial collaboration, also very relevant for pain, because we cannot solve issues such as pain uh, without just by looking at the medical part. We also need to look at other sectors like the social sector, for example. Um, and we, for this also, we need evidence. How do you ensure and improve cooperation across sectors? How, for example, how do you uh, move towards integrated care? Um, everybody agrees in principle that integrated care is the way forward. It's easier said than done because it requires a very different organizational model. Uh, but there are some examples, often at regional level, I must say, where this has been done very successfully with good results. Uh, in all aspects. So we need to, to learn from that and see how we can transpose that into a wider setting. Um, you know, and this, this is a very urgent business. I cannot overstate this. Um, if I go back to the state of health process I just mentioned, if you look at another important fact which came out, the link between non-communicable diseases and employment. You know, employment or unemployment is the key challenge in many European countries, and it threatens the future of Europe socially and politically. And if I give you just one figure, if you look at, Europe, at healthy Europeans between the age of 50 and 59, 74% of healthy Europeans in that age bracket are in work. But if you look at the ones who suffer from more than one chronic disease in the same age group, the figure falls to 52%. So there is a clear link between chronic disease and labor market participation, leading uh, possibly even to exclusion uh, from uh, the labor market. And of course, this leads to a whole host of problems. Um, now, I emphasize chronic disease, non-communicable disease, because most of these are accompanied by pain um, at some stage or other. Um, it's, it's an intrinsic part. Um, 
you know, and, and, and one of the issues which I think we have to really bring out more clearly is the perspective of the patient. Because as I said before, pain is not something that can be measured through clinical parameters. The only way you can find out about it is to ask the patient. So, and the only way you can identify if the outcomes are improving or not is by asking the patient. And one thing we are learning, uh, when we ask patients, they tend to have a different idea of outcomes. The patients tend to define outcomes in terms of functionality. Does this disease, this problem, prevent me from doing something which is important to me? This is how they do. And this is something which is often not well understood by medical doctors who tend to think in terms of clinical parameters. Those, of course, are very important because they give you a tool of measurement. But what really matters from the patient's perspective is whether they can continue to do the things that are important to them, such as playing with their children or just doing regular everyday things. This is something which is generally not measured systematically. Um, and to do this, we have to work, as I said, across sectors. So, Against this background, I am very pleased to announce, um, as we have already heard, that the SIP has today launched um, a stakeholder expert group under the EU Health Policy Platform. The EU Health Policy Platform was born out of the realization on the Commission side that we need to go beyond the usual interaction between our many stakeholders and ourselves. Uh, stakeholders typically, of course, and they are very, always very welcome to do this, of course, um, give us their views, they, they, they put pressure on us to deliver certain things, and they react to whatever we produce. But we think we should go a step further. We need to have a constant, active dialogue, not just between individual stakeholders and the European Commission, which is always very important, but also among the stakeholders. Um, this is something which needs to be facilitated, and the Commission has put in place um, this um, uh, fr uh, this uh, f uh, platform, which will be a mix of virtual and physical uh, discussions, um, this will not be driven by the Commission. It will be a space where stakeholders can actually decide on what they want to discuss, what they want to present to the Commission, um, identify issues that are important to them, uh, potentially culminating in the preparation and submission of um, specific positions agreed among multiple stakeholders. Um, a space for discussion, um, a space for you know, collaboration. Um, citizens today want not just to influence positively the development of legislation and, and policy, they want to be part of that. And there is no better area to do this than in the area of health, and I think we should encourage that. And in practice, to do this next autumn, um, DG Sante will publish on this health policy platform a call for proposals for new teams for joint statements, which will be prepared during 2018 and which will then be taken up by the Commission, um, also in discussion with our member states. We want to match, on the one hand, what member states need, what stakeholders see as the priorities, and then we will see how we can best use the instruments we have at European level to support that, to bring all this together. And we will, uh, um, at the next physical meeting of the health policy platform, which is planned to take place on the 15th of November, uh, we plan to approve the first batch of proposals which will be taken forward. So I, I would really encourage you uh, to uh, be very active on this. We already have a thousand health stakeholders, individual organizations, um, uh, participating in this network. I'm glad to hear you have another 300 uh, lined up. That's very good, because we also want to encourage discussion between different uh, sectors. Um, for example, there are other groups that are working on professionals. Now, one thing we need to also see is how we can support professionals and the uh, continuous professional development of professionals to better understand aspects such as pain management uh, and to disseminate information uh, and the state of, of knowledge about this topic. Um, so, really, I would like to encourage you to be active in this, to engage as many stakeholders as possible uh, to really get this important issue, really important issue, high on the political agenda and exploiting all the possible synergies and links with other areas. Um, of course, it goes without saying, when we work with stakeholders, um, we also have to ensure that we have complete clarity on conflicts of interest and, 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 and so on, but um, I am sure that this uh, will not be a problem. Uh, to conclude, I would like to propose two take-home messages to you. First, um, it's very good to be aware about the challenge of non-communicable diseases such as pain 
and what they mean to our health systems. It's, it's good to exchange points of view and information on how to tackle them. But what would really make the difference at the end of the day is whether and how we apply the knowledge gained at home. So this is not just a discussion. It should be a discussion aimed towards implementation, whether it's at national, regional, local, or European level, uh, as is most appropriate. But that's what really will make the difference. And this is why I would like to ask for your support in our new approach to select best practices, um, ranging from health promotion, prevention, to management of non-communicable diseases, such as pain, and then to help us with transferring them to other places where such practices could have an impact. Now, this is in itself also a challenging process because you cannot just cut and paste. What works in one uh, region or, or, or situation will need to be adapted to the needs of the receiving um, uh, location. But that's something also where we can work together. The second take-home message is, is, is we need to seek strong allies outside the health sector. The data is becoming more and more convincing. Socioeconomic status affects health as much as risk factors do. Um, we cannot continue to talk about health in isolation. This is, health is not just um, of interest to the health community. If you'll allow me, you know, before joining the European Commission, before working in health, I worked here in the Maltese National Administration on other topics. Um, I worked for some time in environmental protection. And I realized that health today is where environment was in the 1990s. We have to mainstream health. We cannot continue just to have discussions on health among the health community, as important as that is. We have to reach out to the ultimate decision makers, the people who hold the purse strings, the people who actually decide on national priorities. You know, how important is health compared to other things? Uh, and again here, uh, we need to work together to reach out to other sectors, whether they are the fiscal sector, the employment sector, the environmental sector, and of course, the private sector and professional groups. And it's only by joining forces with other sectors and mainstreaming issues such as health that we will be able to make a difference to the health of European citizens. We know that some of the most effective measures with positive impact on health will not be in the health sector. They will be, for example, in the social sector. Well, that, that is a key message which we cannot afford to underestimate. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased that uh, SIP has been able to launch this new expert group uh, in the EU health policy platform. This is, I think, a milestone. We can certainly use this now to work uh, on the many um, areas where work is needed. And I would also like to conclude by thanking uh, the government of Malta for bringing the issue of non-communicable diseases and pain onto the agenda of the presidency, and again, the SIP platform for your continuous strong engagement in addressing pain across the EU. It's a great inspiration for us and will really serve to drive us forward. So thank you very much for your attention.